Thanks. You be seated. Somebody asked me today if I was still going to preach. Yes, I'm still going to preach. Uh, doctrine. Remember, that's the that's a cornerstone of who we are is sound biblical teaching. So we want to finish up this morning our series on the parables. Believe it or not, we've done this 36 times now at the end of the day. Uh, depending on how you look at the parables, there are a couple that um, uh, odd and end ones. We're actually going to look at three this morning, and you go, wait a minute, how are you going to do that? It's going to be fast, uh, so just hang on as we go. We're going to finish up that series this morning, and then next week we're going to start a new series. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at the life of Joseph. Uh, so if you want to read ahead, you can read at the end of Genesis on the life of Joseph. I did find out, I did preach on this actually in 2002, so if you can remember that. If I didn't remember preaching on it. Uh, so we're going to be looking at the life of Joseph, and there's just a ton. It's one of my favorite Bible characters. Uh, Joseph has some tremendous insight for you, and not only how you handle difficulties and how you handle hardship, but also uh, in parenting, there are a ton of lessons in there as well, and uh, actually we're going to look at a lot of parenting lessons next week, actually. So uh, it'll, be a fun, it'll be a fun trip. So uh, that's where we're headed next. This morning, like I said, I'm going to look at three kind of catch-all parables, but they all are kind of saying the same thing. That's why I grouped them all together. Um, the parable of the strong man, which is found in three of the Gospels, the parable of the absent householder, and then the parable of the evil and wise steward. So, hang on, here we go. Luke 11. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up his plunder. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not scatter with me scatters. Very simple principle. Here's what Jesus said. In this context, they're asking Jesus, they said, look, by what authority are you doing this stuff? And their idea was that he was from Satan, and Jesus in a number of times says, well, Satan doesn't cast out Satan. That would be kind of stupid. So instead, he uses this analogy here, and he says, look, if you want to take something from somebody, and they're guarding it, you have to bind them. That's the only way you can do it. You have to be more powerful than the person that you're trying to take something from. So Jesus is using this to basically say this, look, the reason I can cast out Satan is because I'm more powerful than Satan. So I simply bind Satan and then I take what I want, I do what I want because I have that ability because I'm stronger. And then he ends with it by saying this, you've got to choose who you're going to follow. You don't get to choose both. You choose one or the other. You're either for me or you're against me. There's no, there's no middle in this parable at all. So he kind of lays out that principle um, in that passage. Then the other parable, another parable is Mark 13. Here's what he says. Be on guard. Be alert. You don't know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house, puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and he tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch. You do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to everyone, what I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. And he uses this parable to get this idea that, look, you don't know when I'm coming back. Because they always wanted to know that. And Jesus is like, you don't ever know. You've seen this over and over again in the other parables. And Jesus basically says, look, you need to understand you need to always be ready because you never know when I'm going to show up. You don't know when that time will come. My father-in-law, um, again, dealing with Alzheimer's, we appreciate your prayer for him. They put him on hospice last week. But um, uh, we love getting him to talk about military stuff. And one of our favorite stories is the one he tells. What happened was when he was a kid, he didn't want to go to school. So his mother looked at him and said, you have two choices. You go to school or you sign up for the military. And he said, I don't want to go to school. So she took him to a recruiter's office, lied about his age, and they sent him, this during the Korean War, and they sent him to, to basic training. Um, now we think that because everybody could see that he was not 18, that instead of sending him to Korea, they sent him to Germany. 
And so he was in Germany, and he tells the story that one night he was on guard watch, and he had fallen asleep. And somebody came into the area that he was staying and took his weapon from him and disassembled it and laid it all out on the table. He woke up looking at his weapon that had been is all in pieces. And of course, those of you in the military know, you can put that thing back together with your eyes closed. Well, he put it back together really, really fast and thought that he was going to get in trouble, and he went, and nobody said anything to him. He was in a situation that following week where he had to confront an officer about something, and I think it was a bar thing where he had to, the bar was closed and he needed to get him to leave. I don't remember all the details, but... Yeah, the, so the bar was closing, and he said, sir, I need you to leave because they're trying to close the bar. And he said, uh, Private Vaughn, is it? He said, yeah. He said, how long did it take you to assemble that weapon? He said, uh, sir, you have a good evening. And turned around and walked off because he realized you can do whatever you want to do um, at that point. But he learned a lesson. You think my father-in-law ever fell asleep on his watch again? No, not on your life. This is what Jesus says, look, you be ready. You be ready because you never know when I'm going to come back. And then he tells this story. Uh, I'm going to jump halfway into the story. You can read the earlier part of it. In it. But Peter asked him, Lord, why are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? And Jesus, the Lord answered, said, Who then is faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to get in their food allowances at the proper time? It'll be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. He says, it's going to be great when the master returns, you're doing what you're supposed to do. Truly, I tell you, he'll put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the servant says to himself, my master's taking too long time in coming. And then he begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, to eat and to drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, in an hour that he's not aware of, and he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. The servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving of punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Jesus uses this parable here to talk about to the response of a, of, a, of a servant to two different scenarios. In one response, he does exactly what the master said. The master comes back, everything's awesome. In the other one, he decides, you know what? The master's taking too long. I'm going to take advantage of my position. And he acts in a selfish way. And he says, when the master comes, he's going to punish him. We talked about this when we talked about the rich man and Lazarus. Um, a lot of people actually use this passage to believe that um, there is actually degrees of punishment for people who have rejected God. And here he talks about a, a master who knows what he was doing was wrong, is treated very, very harshly, and someone who still did what was wrong but may not have known it is still treated, still punished, but not as severely. And so Jesus uses this illustration to basically say to people, look, you need to understand, if your master's giving you much, then you better be doing much. Um, and it's a, a sobering parable for us because I'm going to tell you right now, you need to understand, the poorest person in America is still one of the richest people in the world on a, on a purely financial basis. Uh, you know, we have been incredibly blessed. Uh, the freedoms that we have, the resources that we have, the opportunities that we have. I mean, I know, you know, you get all, you get all um, bent out of shape when your gravel road does not meet up to your standards because, you know, we stopped using gravel a long time ago. Uh, but, you know, we get all bent out of shape on that. Have you ever seen the main road in Papua New Guinea? Okay. I'm telling you, your gravel road looks like a super highway, you know. But again, why? Just because we've been given so much that we just take for granted. And Jesus goes, look, you need to understand. I expect one from you. I expect one from you. So he kind of, all these parables kind of have this same idea. And, and, and the idea is simply this, that, you know, first of all, you got to make a choice. It's like the strong man thing. you got to make a choice who you're going to follow. And then you need to be prepared because you never know when the Lord's coming back. 
You never know when that day comes that you take your last breath. And then the idea of, and when you do, you need to know there's an accounting for how you've lived your life. So these three parables, I think, kind of reiterate what we've seen in all of the parables. So I want to close this morning with this idea. I want to look at four things that, big picture things that I learned from the parables as a whole. Okay, So I'm kind of going to go through the whole, uh, just key, a couple of really key ideas that they're taught. Uh, first one is this. Kingdom principles are not earthly principles. Often in the teaching of the parables, what Jesus says is opposite of the way we would do it in the world. That ought to be, by the way, a great standard for you to have to figure out sometimes when you're trying to figure out what does God want me to do. One of the easiest ways to do it is figure out what the world wants you to do and do the opposite. The Bible says, do you want to get? Give. You want to lead? Serve. There's so many things in the Bible that are flipped from this world's perspective. You've seen it as Jesus teaches in a parable. Often, you know, he, 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 he takes these ideas and he, he's like, okay, you want to talk about who you invite to a banquet? You don't invite people who can help you. You invite people who can do nothing for you. That is so contrary to the world. The world says, no, no, no. You need to invite people who, who will do something for you that, that you can get something from. Kingdom principle is completely different. So what I would encourage you to do is when you're looking at, 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 at what's the right thing to do or what should I do in this situation, understand this. Most of the time, kingdom principles are opposite what the world has us to do. Second idea that you see in these ideas is you need to be very, very careful and use your time wisely. Um, we've seen this over and over and over again. Invest in things that matter. Um, one of the things that I've learned is that people are eternal. So when you invest in something that affects people, that's where you have the greatest influence. Jesus over and over again, you know, he said, you know, you be salt and light. Um, the Good Samaritan, the parable of the Good Samaritan, you go in and do what even the religious people refuse to do during that time. You make a difference where you can make a difference. You know, I'm fortunate as a pastor, I get to have the opportunity every week to speak and to talk to a group of people. But here's the bottom line. You have a group you pastor all week long too. Whether it be your family, whether it be your coworkers, whether it be the other, you have the opportunity to influence and be salt and light there as well. That's the mission field. That's the ministry God's put you in. And that's what he's saying. Make, Jesus says, look, make, make a, make, use your time wisely. Uh, the third idea, and we talked about this when I talked about the rope, is this idea of life is unpredictable. It is so short compared to eternity. It's so small. And yet we make what we're going through so big. But when you drop it in light of eternity, it's but as Paul said, it's but a moment. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more and exceeding weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. Because the things which are not seen are eternal. And what I would say is, you know, one of the things that you see in this parable is this idea that, look, you don't know how much time you have here, so you make every day count. You come to the end of the day and you put your head in your pillow and you can go, you know what, I, 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 did, I did what I could today for the kingdom of God. And that's the way we have to approach it. I enjoyed the day that God gave me. And how often do we get up griping and complaining about it? Um, you know, oh, you know this and all that and all that. You were given another day. And it's unpredictable. You don't know that you're going to get another. You're not, you, don't, you don't know you get tomorrow. But you've got today. And the last thing is this, that you see in these, parable, these kingdom parables is this. The decision you make about Jesus Christ here determines your future there. I don't care whether you want to believe in a hell or not. 
Here's what I will tell you. Jesus did, and Jesus spoke of it often. In fact, he spoke more of it than he did of heaven. One of the things that you've seen, if you've listened to anything in these parables, here's what you've heard over and over and over again in every parable. There was no second chance. Over and over again in these parables, the door was shut. Over and over again in these parables, there was a finality to the decision that was made. There's this idea of what you do here determines there, and there's not another chance when you get there. And that's the soberness of these parables. So it is so important that you have to look at your life and say, what have you done with Jesus Christ? Have you accepted him as your personal Savior? Because what you do here determines whether or not he accepts or rejects you there. And he said over and over again, on that day, many will say, didn't I do all these things? And I'll say, I don't know you. I don't know you. And that's, you know, we have to really sit down and ask ourselves, are we ready to go? Because the reality is this. Again, will you probably be here tomorrow? Yep, odds are good. Odds are good. Can you guarantee it? Nope. How important is that thing, that person you're all ticked off at? How important is it if you go to their funeral by the end of the week? I, I think you leave, li, live with short accounts. I don't ever want to look or go to a graveside service or go to a funeral service with regrets. So keep short accounts. Um, keep short accounts. Life is too important. And I just want to challenge you with this idea because as, as we look at life here, I think sometimes we forget that what we do in this short amount of time determines everything for eternity. So make it, make it count and do what God wants you to do. So I close this morning with this. The parables of Jesus Christ remind us that God's kingdom is different from the world on this earth. Jesus teaches us to use our time here wisely. Our existence here is unpredictable. So we've always got to be ready to meet our master. What we decide to do with Jesus here determines where we spend eternity with him or apart from him. Choose Jesus while you still have the opportunity because you will spend eternity somewhere when your life on this earth ends here. Let's pray, Lord. Thanks for your word. We all, this morning, have made a choice. We've accepted you or we've rejected you. May each person here have settled in their heart that they've accepted you as their Lord and Savior. Lord, for those of us that have done that, may we use this day to honor you, to glorify you, to do what you would have us to do for your kingdom in all we say and do. And may we come to the end of this day, Lord, and we be able to look back on it in all of the ways, Lord, that uh, you have used us, whether it be big or small. These things we ask in your name. Amen. Um, let's stand together. We're going to sing Jesus Paid It All. Let's stand as we sing. Thank you.